Thank you, Ashwin, for this wonderful invitation, the Viramal uh, Art Foundation, and all of the team that has been, thank you, so kind in extending all the hospitality and arrangements. I must say thank you very much to Rubina. What a beautiful presentation. She sort of brought back Subramaniam, who we've lost recently, and to some of us, uh, uh, it was like losing a father. So um, it's in many ways a difficult uh, um, topic to address, and uh, I, uh, I think that we attempt it with some humility because the man was so great in what he gave to us. I moved to Baroda in 1967 because my father's posting dictated it. In those days, Baroda was still a small town. Its walled city lay snuggling at its epicenter, held between four imposing gateways and the rest of the city seemed to grow around it rather like a spider's web expanding unnoticed. As my life sh took shape in these new surroundings, I grew to learn that art and culture had deep roots in the city from the legacies of the Gaikwad rule. However, with the development of industry after independence, royal patronage gave way to the city's industrialists becoming the new patrons of art, and these associations established close relationships between the artists and their benefactors that lasted through the years and which continued to be sustained and be carried forth by the later generations of these dynastic families. The Faculty of Fine Arts from its inception had garnered a reputation as an art college of high standard and commanded the attention of young professionals to come and teach. Therefore, it is not surprising that in 1951, on the behest of N.S. Bendre and K.G. Subramaniam, uh, Subramaniam, joined the faculty as a lecturer and remained with this institution as one of its most dynamic educators till 1980. My earliest memory of meeting Manisa dates back to when I had just moved to the city myself. I don't suppose this meeting with a nine-year-old imprinted itself on his consciousness in the slightest way at all. But I remember being impacted by this stately man whose manner conveyed his complete and utter commitment to the arts. Nine years later, I enrolled as a student at the Faculty of Fine Arts and after the mandatory two-year preparatory course, joined the painting department, which was headed by K.G. Subramaniam. As a teacher, he had very clear ideas regarding the structure for art education in India. He implemented an interpretation of the syllabi that allowed for his vision to be realized by creating the necessary framework of references to be explored and learned from. His closeness to Nandalal Bose, Vinod Bihari Mukherjee, and Ram Kinkar Bej, whilst he had been at Chanti Niketan, had provided him an insight into differing methodologies of approach to aesthetic inquiries, and his own curiosities also led him to seek out and problematize from the situations of art practice around him. He attempted to decipher ways to trace connections with the past without negating the unavoidable consequences of what, moder what modernity brought as its territory of investigation within the cultural space. Subramaniam as an artist and independent India grew together. His preoccupations during his life were completely with art and culture, and as he states in his preface of his book of essays, Moving Focus, it was rooted in the concerns of looking at the focal changes as had taken place or were still taking place in the art situations of his times. His interest lay in the engagement with modernism and the varied discourses of nationalist sentiments alongside the influences of the New Age discoveries of internationalism as it took shape in the era of post-independence India. His writings on these issues tabulate the changes of a new independent India and initiates the process of questioning normative ideas of cultural traditions. The importance of his theoretical ideation is that it gave to the painting department an environment that was very sharp in the rigors it set as intellectual parameters to be cultivated and adhered to. His influence within the college was very evident. His role as the older was never ever challenged nor the position of his authority he assumed ever questioned. 
His engagement with students was not to determine what their stylistic influence should be, but instead to engage them in a framework of learning that could expose them to the multiplicity of varied and diverse art forms of merit, and from where one could then formulate wider discourses of comprehension to the world. Not a man much given to exhibiting his emotions or tolerating the frills and whimsies of teenagers who were finding their tentative moorings in an adult world, he could often be perceived as holding himself aloof. He demanded of you as a student within the space of the classroom to take yourself seriously at all times. His demeanor as a teacher was one that disallowed you any undue familiarity, nor the mistaken belief that you were ever his equal. He was always the prevailing patriarch, omnipresent and mindful of his role as an interlocutor with the world of varied cultures and seeing himself as the bridge of connectivity to spaces of new discoveries. A cultural protagonist in many ways, he was vocal in his critique on how art administration should be handled by the state and what criteria of engagement by governmental agencies needed to be in place for the artists and artisans of modern India. His letters to bureaucrats and governmental officials are published by Seagull Publishers and are an education in themselves in how he became an, invent an interventionist through the positions he took at a national level on issues of cultural policy. An academic administrator, he was equally successful and stood out as a figure of authority who understood how to handle university bureaucracy and simultaneously preserve the autonomy of the college through methods of negotiation and quiet diplomacy. His progressive ideas regarding education reflected itself in the choice of teachers whom he brought into the painting and mural department. From honoring the knowledge of a Jaipur fresco traditional craftsperson like Sri Gyasilalji and appointing him as an instructor in the mural department, to hand-picking Nasreen Mohammadi and personally inviting her to join the painting department to teach drawing, he, he proved his commitment to creating an environment of learning that was diverse and challenging and most importantly non-conformist. His approach to teaching has always been very measured. He kept his finger on the pulse of whatever was happening in every department in the college. When classrooms were emptied of students in the afternoon who were either in theory classes or having lunch, you would find Mani Sir doing his rounds of the painting department classrooms. He would look intently at the works of students propped up in their easels or pinned onto the display boards. Highly observant and with a memory that never failed him, recalling even the minutest of details, he intimately knew the progress of each student without calling any attention to this fact. Not one to be found with the other teachers who grouped around the common table in the painting department studio, he sat instead in the side room found immediately next to the staircase on the first floor of the painting department. As you approached the stairs to go down, you would see him through the open doorway absorbed in work, either drawing or painting or reading, but never idle always engaged with the pursuit of communing within a world of inquiry and intellectual reverie. What is interesting to this memory is that we as students came to expect this as the norm. This room was always a special place to be invited into because he brought into it his world of many varying interests, making toys, illustrating children's books, designing murals, engaging with textiles, writing, painting, even writing poems. His methodology was to keep all things around him piled on tables and chairs, always within arm's reach, and therefore in control of his own world without undue assistance or the paraphernalia of a coterie of telas. It is in this same room where he would also meet with students on a one-on-one -on -one basis. Seated in an upright wooden chair, he would view their works often in silence. At the end of the session, more often than not, two piles of work would be visible. The larger pile was almost always the one that hadn't met up to the standard he sought from you. But instead of embarking on a lengthy explanation as to what was wrong, he would often just look you straight into the eye and say with an enigmatic half-smile, Chalo, 
और काम करो वो बिटाइड एनी स्टूडेंट हु थॉट दे कुड प्रोलॉन्ग द इंटरल्यूड थ्रू आइडल चैटर he would cut them down to size immediately not because he desired to be mean spirited but because he was intolerant of pretentiousness in any form subramaniam was extremely lucid and articulate yet as a teacher in the classroom he often chose the strategy to sometimes be reticent in such situations he came across as cryptic and the students were left with the with the task of having to introspect on what he had said and to find its meaning through their personal endeavors of reading and research he was not a teacher to give you that easy entry into a world of ideation and creativity thereby making learning a much more experiential and process driven space of self discoveries he laid great emphasis on students being conversant with world art history and he would berate your ignorance if on display by rather tersely ticking you off His desire was not for art history to produce regressive ideas but for you to find your reality through a contextualized space of personal belonging. His life exemplified his belief that the production of work is finally what instructs you the most. To free the hand through experiments with material and language and to open the mind to an experiential world was what he believed was also a way to examine your own personal truth. his discourses as a teacher brought it to focus what all manners of relationship with the world at large offers ways by which to engage with diverse cultures and their traditions allowing us to then reinvent within these frameworks of reference to find new dimensions of meanings for ourselves he was very emphatic that teaching practices within art schools could be only through exposure could not be only through exposure to urban contemporary ideas of art and theory alone and provided every opportunity for interactions to be established with disciplines of creative expression that came from the folk and tribal areas of ritualistic practices his interest with the pop culture space brought the indian bazaar quirkiness into the classrooms that he taught in and the introduction of the playful as a relevant pictorial element to confront the faculty of fine arts was far more integrated as a college of interdisciplinary pra- practices during the e- era of kg subramaniam he introduced to the students a forum of discourse that came to be colloquially referred to as the saturday lecture by mani sir students would cram into the hot auditorium in college in the peak of summer and our recollections of his saturday discourses hold memories of how simple words could transform into expansive arenas to provoke deeper contemplation life was absorbed by him through the prism of pragmatism and acrobic wit which kept him distanced from the trappings of sentimentality as an artist his works despite their narrative investment rely on formalist devices that are not accidental His teachings reflected this because he never spoke too much to students about the meanings within their work. Instead, his approach was to assess art from its formal attributes. This played a crucial role in how Baroda as an art college developed during his tenure. Despite the faculty being known as an art school where figuration was the prevailing or dominant currency of pictorial expression, His teaching methods insisted that a formalist approach to aesthetics within the critique of a work of art had to be substantiated. Subramaniam was not overtly iconoclastic but held more than a healthy pinch of disdain for the market forces impinging within the space of the art college. He never encouraged art students to source their monetary needs from selling their art. as he viewed this as an infringement upon the freedom of a student to learn unhindered by the influences of commercial agendas he wanted his students to find their imaginative selves through what he termed as innovations between the seen and the imagined his interest was not in the faithful rendering of optical realism either in his art he would break down an object and rebuild it playing with the elements of rhythm and form and reconstructing it from the recollection of both seeing and remembering completely opposed to any formula he decried all attempts at stylistic flourishes and posturing imitations by students obliging you therefore to observe and note 
the nuance of every form without obscuring its essential essence through the camouflage of pre pretense. The Fine Arts Fair was a much-awaited campus activity, weaving jewelry terracotta and wooden toys, enamel work, paper mache, leather tooling and mask making, brought new materials and approaches to how students perceived the possibility of making art. The demarcations of craft, uh, traditions, folk practices and contemporary art got blurred. The collective nature of this event brought a democratized environment within the college with seniors and juniors working on equal parity with their teachers. Subramaniam laid great emphasis on this framework being viewed as an important part of each student's um, uh, imbibing process. And though no marks were ever allotted to your participation, you were expected to find where you could fit in to be part of this alternative process of learning. He wanted us to learn that in fact there were no separating boundaries between art and craft. He understood the overlapping within these areas where influences interpolate and asserted that the subject of aesthetic engagement is not completely invested with meaning only from the intervention of the artist's imaginative play, but equally from being embedded within a larger context of their own affili affinities of belonging. As a teacher, he brought to, uh, to our attention the fundamental correlation of life with nature as something to be observed and learnt from. Subramaniam never slowed down, even as he grew older. His prolific production of work, in fact, seemed to increase as time went by. He mentioned once in passing, when the conversation was about ageing, that he lived each day only to make art. Coming from anyone else, that statement would have appeared cliched. But from him, it was just a simple fact being st stated, neither for effect nor to impress anyone, but just as the truth of his existence. As artists, we are often asked about our teachers and what we cherish as memories about them. For me, I hold memorable the lessons I learned about discipline and the practice of ethics as imperative within all areas of conduct from observing him. As a teacher, he perhaps understood how impressionable young art students can be, coming from varied backgrounds and differing economic realities, and he therefore took his role very seriously in shaping the territory of learning to encompass different potential experiences and harness those elements into a curriculum of study. Many years after being his student, I became friends with Manisa. Living close by, I would sometimes drop over after my walk in the park and spend an hour talking with him as dusk fell. His front screen door was never locked throughout the entire day, and whoever visited him would simply enter unannounced. He would be sitting in his chair in the drawing room, surrounded by all his books and paints, drawing and painting incessantly. He was still the same man, albeit a bit older, who we would see through the open doorway of his room in the college, still engaging with the world with uncompromised passion and belief. A glass of water and a plate with savouries would be brought out immediately as the ritual of welcome for all guests. I would sit curled up in a chair with my feet tucked underneath me, and we would meander through conversations of varying nature. I would listen to him as he traced cultural histories and articulated his concerns regarding contemporary art or recounted anecdotes of his life and travels. These interludes with my teacher made time come full circle for me. Only now, the bridges that connected us were from different spaces of our respective need. The master never abdicated his seat of wisdom ever, but opened a new space of sharing that reinvented energies and positioned new avatars of engagement for himself with the world. Thank you so much.